Yesterday, there was a paper published that caught my eye. That paper was about the nature, fundamental nature of mutations and asking the question, do mutations occur randomly? Now, this paper was a response to a previously published paper earlier this year that had um, made quite a splash and I know generated a lot of discussion. And from that discussion, the two authors of this paper um, did some further analyses in order to test the conclusions of that paper. So I wanna take a quick look at that original paper from 2022. We'll just read the abstract, uh, talk about the significance of that paper and why it was controversial. And then I wanna talk about this new publication from yesterday that responds um, to some of the points uh, from that paper. So hot off the presses, we've got do mutations occur randomly? That's coming up. Now, in order to make sense of these two papers, we need to discuss what a mutation is or what the types of mutations that we're talking about uh, before we can ask this really fundamental question, do mutations occur randomly uh, with respect to the genome? Uh, so as you see in this uh, image before you, uh, we've got some DNA code written out, A, C's, G's, and T's. And so I think all of us, uh, I think all of us would understand that uh, it's one type of mutation that we could talk about is any change in that particular code. And there's a lot of ways you can change that code. You can uh, replace a single base pair with another so that A could be changed into or replaced with, say, a T, a thymine. Uh, that could occur to any of those letters, and we call those single um, nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, they're changes at a single nucleotide. Now, the, the other thing that could happen is you could uh, add a base, right? You could insert something here, so now you have uh, A, A, A instead of just two A's. Uh, you could delete a base, and so that particular base would be missing in future generations. Uh, and obviously, you can add much larger numbers of of base pairs or delete larger numbers of base pairs, or you can rearrange the base pairs in what's called an inversion. We simply want to talk about single nucleotide polymorphisms, and in particular, we just want to talk about these base pair changes from one letter to another letter. And so any organism has a genome that's composed of a certain number of A, C's, G's, and T's, and they're in a particular order. Right, I have several billion base pairs of DNA in each one of my cells, and I could read that particular code as an order of A, T, C's, and G's. Now, interestingly, if I were to sequence this, the one cell in this finger over here and take another cell from this finger over here, and I were to sequence those codes, and I were to ask, uh, what's the code in both of those cells? And if I line those two codes up and ask the question, do I have the exact same code in both those cells? I most certainly don't. I probably have potentially hundreds of thousands of differences between the codes in one finger versus another finger. But presumably I started with the same code, right? Because I started as a single cell. And in that single cell, I would have one sequence, at least for that chromosome. Now I, I do have... I have information from both my mother and my father, but let's stick to one copy, all right, that my father's copy of chromosome number one, all right? I still have copies of that in this finger and this finger over here. And uh, if I'm sequencing just chromosome number one, uh, you would say, all right, I would expect them to be the same or at least very similar. And actually you shouldn't expect them to be the same because it's not really possible, all right, uh, at the chemical level, uh, the mechanisms that are used to copy our DNA cannot copy it perfectly. They're, they're, they're unable to uh, do their job with 100% efficiency. And therefore, they make mistakes. All right. And so mistakes are made and accumulate such that by the time you have maybe hundreds of millions of, of, of copies of that genome, by the time you get to the cells in my two fingers, um, there could be hundreds of thousands of mistakes having been made. And so when I compare my codes in, in two different cells in my body, I will find they're not exactly the same. And I will see these things that we call mutations. Now, the fundamental question that we're asking here is, 
or, or a way of thinking about this is, can I predict where those mutations will occur? All right, is there any way for me to say, uh, looking across this code, uh, I can predict that the next time this, uh, this cell divides, it's going to change this particular A, all right, and leave all the other bases alone. Uh, and then the next time it changes, it will change this particular T. Right? No, when I see the next, uh, when I see the next generation, and I see okay, well, this uh, the, your DNA polymerase, your machine that reads your DNA and or makes a copy of your DNA uh, during mitosis, um, it will make mistakes. But I have no way of predicting where those mistakes will occur. At least that's been the uh, presumption. All right, and. Um, for a long time is that the mutations are random with respect to our ability to predict where they might, may occur. And so this random nature forms the sort of a, a, the fundamental idea that every time cell divisions are occurring, or you want to think about it, you could think about it as individual generations of, of generations of individuals when they replicate, all right, when human beings have children or when any other organism uh, any other species has individuals that make more individuals, they're going to have to make a copy of their code for those individuals, and there will be mistakes made. And the assumption has been, and I would say up to this point, uh, the, the observations have suggested that the sequence will not be predictable in terms of where those changes will have occurred. Right? It's random with respect to the fitness or importance of that particular piece of DNA. So we end up with the phrase, mutations happen, right? They just happen. And it's up to the, the organism then who it then experiences this mutation or, or is, receives the mutation, right? If it's an offspring, it says like, a mutation occurred in the sperm or the egg, and so the next generation receives a copy of this mutation. Uh, that individual then has to deal with that mutation. Now, it's in dealing with the mutation that you then have these other processes of, uh, or we'll call them evolutionary mechanisms uh, happening, right, in all different organisms. And one of those mechanisms is natural selection. Uh, that particular mutation may not have positive consequences for the organism, and therefore make that organism less fit in that environment. And so the fate of that particular uh, mutation may be that it is, has negative fitness and therefore will be selected out of that particular in population. It's not selected out of the individual. The individual has the mutation. And they really can't do anything about it other than not survive, right, uh, or survive and have offspring. Another possibility is, is the mutation is neutral. It really doesn't have an effect on that particular individual, and they go on their merry way and uh, live their life completely unaware of the fact that they don't have the exact same code uh, that they did. And, it, and going back to my two fingers here, if I have hundreds of thousands of differences uh, in my code between my two fingers, and yet when I look at my fingers, it's like they're pretty much identical and they're performing the same functions, right? Um, I can say those particular mutations that have occurred in my genome, in those cells, um, from the copies, from that original copy that made me. I can, I can pretty confidently say that those mutations don't make any difference to me in, with respect to my fitness and my ability to perform the functions I need to perform with those two fingers. Uh, so we know that many, many, many mutations uh, don't have a significant effect. They're either neutral or very closely, or very so close to neutral that we're unaware that they make any difference to us at all. All right, so back to you've got a code, the code is changing, and the presumption is is that mutations are happening just sort of randomly. All right, the, you know, out of if you copy a billion base pairs, you're going to make X number of mutations, and those mutations will be scattered randomly across that particular sequence, and there won't be any distinguishable pattern to where those uh, mutations occur. Uh, in other words, there's no other sort of force that's saying, no, no, don't mutate over here, but yes, 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 you may mutate in this particular portion of the genome, but you can't make any mutations over here. Now, this idea was kind of uh, I don't want to say rocked, but I'll say was challenged, all right, by this paper that came out in early 2022 that we're going to take a look at. Um, 
And because it suggested that there are, in fact, or at least they, their interpretation of the data is that there are segments of the genome uh, in Arabidopsis, a particular type of plant, a mustard plant, there are segments of the genome of that mustard that appear to be less frequently mutated than other portions of the genome. Uh, and specifically, really important segments of the, of the Arabidopsis genome, like crucial genes, uh, segments that, that hold crucial genes, don't seem to have the same numbers of mutations occurring in those locations as does other areas. And that suggests that there may be some other mechanism, all right, some, something above the genome that is looking down upon the process and saying, this particular segment of DNA, we're not going to allow as many mutations. The, the raw, actual, original mutations, the mutation rate uh, will be lower for some segments of the DNA and higher for other segments of the DNA. And in that sense, you could say that then mutations aren't random. Um, they may appear random in that particular location, but the fact that there's more in one area and fewer in another is not random, right? Uh, it, um, okay, yeah, I, I'm getting too far into that paper. Let's hold back a little bit because I want to do one other thing in terms of an introduction before we actually dive into those papers. So the basic question we're addressing here is, do mutations occur randomly uh, in the genome? no matter how many mutations that might occur. Because in some organisms, uh, the, the, the mechanism for copying DNA is sloppier, and in some organisms, it is some species, it is more precise, or what we call it has higher fidelity. In other words, there is a machine that copies DNA, and depending on the shape of the proteins, all right, and the chemistry going on there, they're either more precise or less precise, in which case some organisms, like viruses experience large numbers of mutations per every, say, thousand base pairs that they copy. I mean, large, a couple mutations per every thousand base pairs or 10,000 base pairs they copy, as opposed to, say, a human being or some other large eukaryotic uh, nucleated organism with a large genome. They often have higher fidelity uh, mechanisms, all right, for copying their DNA, in which case they don't make as many mistakes. So maybe only one out of every million or one out of every 10 million base pairs, or in some cases, maybe one out of every 100 million base pairs um, is swapped out with the wrong base pair. But that lower mutation rate doesn't mean that the mutations occur at predictable locations. So mutations may occur at higher or lower frequencies between different organisms. But the locations where those mutations occur still appear random with respect to the importance, uh, the position of that particular DNA in the genome. So it's this question of the random nature of the mutations that is at stake here. All right, now I think we're ready to proceed with looking at these two papers that are then wrangling over this question of do we, in real world examples, see patterns in mutations such that maybe this um, presumption of randomness uh, might not be accurate. Maybe there's another phenomena, another mechanism that is in play, that it's in, that's working on organism that is directing mutations to particular locations or you could say directing them away from other locations in the genome. Or in fact, are mutations essentially popping up randomly and it's only after the mutations that occur that natural selection and other forces, other mechanisms, shape which of those mutations survive in locations in the genome versus other locations. All right, let's dig into that. Now, before we do, I have to give my warning that I sometimes give, all right? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like, what am I getting myself into? Well, you are getting to get yourself into a little bit of some geeky molecular genetic stuff. So just a warning, I'm going to, you know, use, I'm going to read some stuff that's going to have a lot of jargon in it. And my job, you know, as a, uh, I guess you could say as an educator is to hopefully sort through that jargon uh, teach you enough about what some of that jargon means um, to address this main question. 
uh, are mutations random with respect to the fitness uh, of any particular location or any particular gene uh, in a genome. All right, so the first paper we want to look at is this one from uh, that was published back there on January 12th, uh, 2022. And this was published in the journal Nature, so one of the, the best journals in the world, most respected journals in the world. And one of the reasons it's published there is because they publish stuff that is, um, you know, considered to be important, like insights, right? Novel stuff, uh, edgy stuff, all right? But hopefully true things, all right? They, they, wanna, they don't want to be known for publishing erroneous information. Um, but they do like to be on the cutting edge in terms of like these are new findings that will be very interesting to the, uh, the scientific community. And this, in fact, was very interesting because it, it addresses a really fundamental question about mutations and the nature of mutations. Uh, so let's read the abstract of this paper just to get a flavor for what they're proposing. All right. Since the first half of the 20th century, Evolutionary theory has dominated, been dominated by the idea that mutations occur randomly. And this is an important clause. So anytime you hear somebody talk about random mutations, uh, it's, it's always with respect to something, right? It's relative to something. And in this case, it's relative to the respect to their consequences, right? In other words, mutations happen not knowing what their consequences are going to be, right? A mutation could occur at a really critical location all right, uh, a particular A changes to a T, which then changes the shape of a protein, which then uh, knocks out the function of that particular gene. And if that gene is necessary for your survival, then the organism is going to be dead. So that's a really, really negative, detrimental, right, low fitness mutation. However, the question here is, do mutation, do, does, do organisms have ways of avoiding having mutations at those locations that would be lethal? Right. In other words, can the organism stop those mutations from going to say, oh, that's a really important location. We, we, we don't want to mess with that. Let's not make a mutation there. Or do mutations happen randomly and once in a while they're going to happen to locations that are really important to the organism. And then the organism is going to die as a result. Can the organism do anything about it? Can they take the randomness out of the original uh, set of mutations that occur? Right now, the, the assumption has been all right, that mutations occur randomly, fundamentally are random with respect to their consequences. Right here, now in this particular paper, these authors are going to test that assumption with a large survey of de novo mutations, that de novo would just mean new mutations that occur in the, the plant Arabidopsis uh, thaliani. Um, and, you know, so that particular plant has lots of mutations, lots of diversity in its genome. And they're saying, but these are all mutations we see are novel and just popped up. And how do they know that? Because they're going to have sequenced the parent plant and they sequence offspring. And so they can see, like, here's the original genome. Hey, here's the new genome. And this new genome has new bases, all right, changes that weren't present in the parents. And so these are de novo, brand new mutations. Um, and we do this now with lots of different organisms, including humans, and we're going to look a little bit at humans in a moment. In contrast to expectations, so there's a certain expectation of where we would find those mutations, we find the muta mutations occur less often in functionally constrained regions of the genome. In other words, mutation frequency is reduced by half inside of gene bodies or portions of code that encode genes or Let's, let's just keep it simple, specifically make proteins, all right? The, the, the protein coding portion of your genome. Um, and by even more in essential genes, and essential genes are just what they sound like. They're the genes that are like absolutely essential for running your operating system, right? Just keeping your cell alive. The basic operations of your cell that if you couldn't do those, you wouldn't have a cell. So I'm not going to read the rest of this abstract because we've, we've touched on the most important observation, uh, and that is that they think that they have identified lower frequencies of mutations, um, that mutations occur less frequently in regions that are important. And so they're saying that th this is the, the original mutations that occur. And so if the original mutations in copying the code 
Uh, and there's fewer of them in important segments of the code versus lesser important segments of the code. That suggests there is a, and as they do suggest, there's an epigenetic epigenome effect, which just means epi just means above, something above the genome. All right, there's something else that is guiding the uh, or, or directing the replication process such that it avoids making mistakes in certain regions of the genome and allows more mistakes to be made in another portion of the genome. Now, those mistakes made in the, the important parts of the genome, there still are mistakes made. It's not like there's no, there isn't any portion of the genome that doesn't make any mistakes. But if there, is a, if there are portions of the genome, segments of it, specifically in, in important genes, that are somehow being uh, directed to having a lower mutation rate, then this, this doesn't mean that the mutations aren't random in that particular portion, right? They still can't predict like where the mutations are going to occur. They just predict, they're just saying that we can see that there's fewer mutations that are occurring in that particular region compared to another region. And that itself is the thing that suggests that uh, they aren't completely random with respect to the fitness, right? We go back to the first line here, with respect to their consequences, right? If there's fewer mutations in genes that are important, then that means the mutation rate is you know, not random with respect to the importance of the thing it's mutating. And so that, again, suggests that there must be some other mechanism in the cell that understands this segment is important, this segment's not as important, you can have more mutations here, you can have less, you should have fewer over here. Um, and that would mean that mutations are not strictly occurring randomly throughout the entire genome, but they have a non-random pattern uh, in the genome. And so going down to the last line here, we conclude that the that epigenomic uh, associated mutation bias is what they're kind of calling it, right? reduces the occurrence of deleterious mutations in Arabidopsis, right? What are the most of the bad mutations gonna be? They're gonna be mutations inside of genes that are important. And if you lower the number of mutations that occur, the fundamental numbers of mutations at the copying level, then you're going to have fewer deleterious mutations over time, right? This challenges the prevailing paradigm that mutation is a directionless force in evolution. Now, why are they saying that? Because they're saying if there is a force, an epigenomic associated mutation bias, that is something that is helping the organism uh, not suffer the consequences of mutations as much as they would if it was completely random. And therefore, that's not a random thing that's occurring, right? We have, like I said, so we have to associate evolutionary theory with the, the random portion of evolutionary theory is that mutations are occurring at random. Uh, the rest of evolution is not so much random because it's natural selection, right? It's selection which is not a random process occurring. And so they're saying even the, even the mutation, where mutations happen, isn't random. Uh, okay, I'm, I, yeah. You see there's multiple levels of random here. So I, I'm going to back up and I'm going to say it again. There might be a stretch of DNA like an important gene, and there might be one mutation that occurs there. It's still random with respect to where that mutation occurs, but there's fewer mutations in that particular segment, and there's more somewhere else. So that's not random with respect to like the overall mutation rate across the whole genome. Um, and so therefore... It's not completely directionless. Evolution isn't just like this, isn't underlying, underlain by this uh, random mutation thing. All right, did a super bad job of explaining that, but I don't think it's worth trying again. I think I'll be able to patch this up uh, when I go to the next paper. <laughs> all right, so, all right, so they throw that out there. All right, and they're saying we're, we're challenging kind of a fundamental paradigm of the nature of mutations in genomes. And that elicits some discussion. I know there's a bunch of people that are, um, especially skeptics of evolutionary theory, they kind of jumped on this. They're like, oh, see, you know, you've been saying this random, but it's not really random. And so that's, 
that appears more like design, right? That that some organ, organisms are able to sort of like say, hey, I'm I'm I can intentionally uh, reduce mutation right here, and I can increase it over here in this other portion of my genome. All right, so now we come up with this paper yesterday that was published, uh, I believe, in the last day or two. And uh, here's the title. Is the mutation rate lower in genomic regions of stronger selective constraints? Right? Is there a difference in mutation rate, fundamental mutation rate, that the mutation rate at the sort of like the original set of mutations that are made in copying your genome? Is the rate lower in some segments of the DNA versus others? Right? Is there a lower rate specifically in regions that are under strong selective constraint? Now, strong selective constraint means important genes, like important genes that you just can't mess with. Uh, and so is the organism able to not even allow mutations to occur there, therefore not having to rely just on selection getting rid of those negative mutations? Right? That would be, you know, wouldn't that be great? Right. If an organism could say, huh, you know what, let's just not make any mutations over there. And therefore, we won't have to uh, count on natural selection selecting out those mutations in some offspring because none of the offspring will have any of those mutations. It's a it's a way of saying I can protect the important portions of my genome, lower my overall mutation rate uh, for future generations. That would be really fantastic, and that would be a great mechanism, evolutionary mechanism, for maintaining the integrity of genomes uh, over time, and specifically maintaining the really important portions of genomes over time. I think of it as like maintaining your basic operating system uh, in organisms. But is it true? All right, that, that's what these authors are asking. It's like, but is that really what happens? As much as it sounds like a nice idea, uh, and the Arabidopsis paper suggests there's evidence for that. We didn't really go through their specific evidence and how they came up with it, um, but they're claiming that they see this pattern. All right, so uh, Lou and Zhang, and Zhang is uh, at the uh, uh, University of Michigan. They published a paper that is, is a respond, direct response to that paper. And it goes a little bit something like this. Oh, and it's in the Journal of Molecular Biology and Evolution. Um, and here is the, let's read the abstract and then we'll look a little more at the details in this particular paper. A study of the plant Arabidopsis detected lower mutation rates in genomic mut regions where mutations are more likely to be del deleterious. Challenging the principle that mutagenesis, right, the original mutations that occur in genomes, is blind to its consequences, right? That mutations don't know what their consequences are going to be, and therefore they just occur randomly uh, in the genome, right? This challenges the principle that mutagenesis is blind to, oh, I just read that. To examine the generality of this finding, right? So they kind of come into it as like, okay, that seems like that's what's happening in Arabidopsis, but you know, Arabidopsis is a very uh, manipulated plant, right, that, that's been in labs for a long period of time and uh, had a lot of done, things done to it. Maybe it's not typical of other organisms. So we want to see if this is a general principle that can be applied widely across many organisms, or maybe it's true for all organisms, that mutation rates aren't uh, completely random. Uh, so... They look at, uh, they analyze mutation date from baker's yeast and human beings. So they're covering fungi and animals, and Arabidopsis is a plant. So they're kind of trying to like hit the three major uh, eukaryotic groups. So what's their result? The yeast data do not exhibit this trend. So trying to analyze their data in a similar fashion to what the Arabidopsis data set was, they don't see a trend of different numbers of mutations in important genes versus non-important genes. Um, whereas the human data show an opposite trend. So initially using the same kind of methods, the same kind of data set, and using the same kind of analyses, they get an opposite trend in humans where, uh, weirdly, there appeared to be more mutations in important genes and fewer mutations in non-coding uh, uh, DNA that, that has lesser, let's call it lesser function. And that 
kind of odd because that's certainly not what you would expect, right? If if there was a a reason to alter where mutations can occur and have some kind of control over mutations, you would definitely predict that you would want to control the mutations that are occurring in important genes and lower those mutation rates. Why would you want to increase the mutation rates in important genes? Because that's going to be detrimental to the organism. Uh, and so that's odd. But you notice the rest of the phrase there that disappears upon the control of potential co uh, you know, confounders. In other words, we identified after we did this analysis that there are a bunch of other things happening in the cells that can explain why we see we see, we had the original observation that there are more mutations in one place than another. We find that a Arabidopsis study identified substantially more mutations than reported in the original data. Uh, generating studies and expected from an Arabidopsis mutation rate. So here's where they're going to get into okay what we you know what we found was is that yeast and humans don't seem to obey the same rules or we don't see the same observations as we see it, we as those who reported their Arabidopsis data. So now that we don't see that occurring, we don't see this non-random pattern. Um, that makes us wonder what's going on in Arabidopsis. Is it a real phenomena or could they have misinterpreted their data? Are they missing something in their data that could have explained away their finding, leaving the baseline assumption in place that Mutations are happening randomly with respect to the fitness of the, the organism or the, or the consequences of those mutations. And that, in fact, is what they do. They say, we looked a little closer at their data set and we found out that they identified a lot more mutations than others have when they look at Arabidopsis. And so if you're, if you're looking at a data set, you see lots of mutations comparing the descendant from the, um, the ancestor um, and they're finding more than others do when they do like, you know, you sequence a plant and then you sequence one of its progeny and they see fewer mutations. You got to ask yourself, why are you seeing more mutations? Well, it might have, have to do with how you count and look at mutations. Because remember, there's, there's other ways to make mutations besides the organism actually making mutation when it copies its DNA. And that is when we copy DNA or we use different, there's a variety of mechanisms for sequencing DNA and, and reading the code. When we read the code, we can make mistakes. Well, those aren't mistakes that are actually mutations, all right, the, in the genome. Those are mistakes we made reading the genome. And so you need to be aware that you're going to have some errors in the read of the code. And you have to be able to identify with the, probabilistically where those errors probably are uh, in order to filter those particular mutations out. Or you have to do things like reread the sequence multiple times of the original uh, of the original sequences and find out where your errors are there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to control for uh, our own error rate that we're adding to the system so that's their first red flag it's like you counted a whole bunch of mutations that nobody else seems to have seen now those may not be real mutations if those aren't real mutations they could follow a pattern right Maybe particularly important genes have particular codes that repeat fairly often. Like, like there's a lot of A's or a lot of T's in those particular genes. And there's a read error that's occurring more often in those sequences, in which case you're going to see those mutations more often in important genes. Or actually, I should flip that around because that's not what they found, right? They found that there was fewer mutations in important genes. But that actually makes sense based on what I just said, all right? Because if you're if you're in an important gene, a protein coding gene, you're probably not going to have runs of T's and A's, like long strings of A's and T's or C's and G's or something like that. Um, what you're going to have is you're going to have more like a random pattern of A, T, C's and G's. Those are less likely to be uh, less likely to incur errors when you read those types of sequences than if you read um, poly T's or poly A's or poly C's. If you have multiple repetitive codes, which you do often have outside of genes, not always, but that's where they're mostly found is outside of genes. Those are much more susceptible to read errors by our DNA sequencing methods. And therefore, you're going to see more errors outside of genes than you will see inside of genes. That would give you the pattern that they saw right away.
Now that's a fairly simple thing. It's a little bit surprising that they would find this in this data because it's kind of a simple answer to explaining their data um, and why they might have misread their data. All right, so let's look at the rest of this here. Um, okay, these extra mutations are enriched in polynucleotide tracts, and they have relatively low sequencing qualities, so are likely sequencing errors. Okay, that's what I just said. Furthermore, the polynucleotide mutations can produce the purported mutation trends in Arabidopsis. So they looked at the polynucleotide mutations. And it's not just that the mutations occur in a stretch of A, 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 like it adds a T. Those are easy to see that you made a mistake in copying. But lots of other research by a lot of other people looking at how mutations occur and types of mutations that occur when we read sequence, all right, sequence read errors know that you're more likely to get mutations 10 or 20 base pairs around those particular um, polycystronic uh, places, or sorry, polynucleotide tracts. And, and those are not going to be quite as easy to identify, but you need to actually do the, the deep analysis to look at all of your different polynucleotide tracts and then look for mutations that occur on either side of them, and you're going to have a higher rate of mutations uh, in that particular location. Um, all right, so furthermore, oh yeah, together our results do not support lower mutagenesis of genomic regions of stronger selectable constra selective constraints in plants, fungal, and animal models examined. It was they could not find that evidence in any other organisms that they looked at, and then when they re-looked at Arabidopsis, they no longer saw the results that this original paper in Nature had seen. All right, so this really, if, if this data is correct, if their analysis is good, this really throws the blanket right over uh, this Arabidopsis paper and says mm, they were seeing an artifact uh, and not something that is a real fundamental property of organisms that they can somehow adjust their mutation rates on purpose so that such that there aren't as many mutations in one segment versus another. All right, let's, so let's go through really quickly and just look at some of their uh, conclusions. So the Arabidopsis mutation trend is not found in yeast in humans. We saw that in the abstract, but here, what did they do? To examine the generality of Arabidopsis finding, we turn to other species with large data of de novo mutations. The yeast is highly studied. Human beings have been highly studied. Uh, we can look at uh, parent offspring uh, sequences and compare them and look for new mutations. And then we can ask the question, where do those new mutations occur? Are they occurring in genes or are they occurring outside of genes? Of course, they're happening in both places, but are they happening more in one than in other? We focused on the correlation between mutation rates of a gene and its DNDS because it's directly relevant to the mutagenesis and evolution of yeast. All right. DN is the number of uh, the frequency of non-synonymous changes, and DS is the frequency of synonymous mutations. So a synonymous mutation would be a mutation that occurs in the sequence, like an A changes to a T, but it has no effect. It's neutral with respect to the protein that's made because the same amino acid is made when you read the code. So that particular mutation doesn't have a, uh, a fitness effect or shouldn't have much of a fitness effect. Uh, it's not going to change what that organism does. And so you can incur these types of mutations, synonymous mutations, without having any obvious phenotypic effect, outward effect. Uh, and so these are the types of mutations, locations you're going to look at. If you look at all the different locations in a gene, that are synonymous. So even in an important gene, there's gonna be locations where, oh, I can change out an A and a T, and it's not gonna make any difference. You're still gonna be able to make ATP synthase or something like that, some really important function for your survival. Uh, and so you can mutate those particular sites. It's the ones that are non-synonymous where you might change uh, a G to an A, and now you change the amino acid from one amino acid to another, which may change the function of that particular protein, the shape of that particular protein. And if you do so, you change the fitness of that particular organism. So what we're, what we're asking is, are those types of 
you know, are the mutation rates or are mutations um, random inside of really important genes? Do they affect non-synonymous and synonymous positions in their original in their original sequence? It's really hard to see the original mutations that occur, right, when you copy a genome, if they occur at non-synonymous sites that are really important. Why is that? Because let's say you did have a mutation, a random mutation occurs, and it occurs right at a spot that uh, knocks out the function for a critical gene. So maybe it happens in the sperm or the egg. The sperm and the egg is alive. They fuse to form a, a, a zygote, which then begins to divide into two cells. Well, when it goes to divide into two cells, it has to copy, uh, and it makes a copy of that particular mutation. And then the organism's like, I need to start using that particular gene because it's vital for my survival going forward. But when it tries to use it, it doesn't function. Those cells die, right? You know, so... And if they die, then we'll never see that mutation, right? Because we're here we are, we're, we're sequencing the offspring, but we're not sequencing the first cell. We're sequencing something that divided several cells down. So in other words, we're sequencing an organism that has survived. So any mutation that, that kills it, we won't see. So we do expect to not see as many mutations overall in really important genes because some of those sites We'll never be, we'll never see them. We'll never see that those mutations happened. So going back to our fundamental question, does that mean the mutations never happened? You know, see, the assumption is the mutations are happening, you know, any old place across that important gene. Sometimes they happen at really important locations, in which case we never see them. And so it looks like they never mutate at those particular sites. But they really do. So I, I, part of what I'm saying here is it's a little hard to actually, you might say, well, why don't we know this? Why don't we know whether mutations are completely random or not? Because it's kind of hard to find out, right? And it's it's kind of hard to measure. Uh, and so we have some more indirect forms of measurement. Let's, so let's just go back to the, the synonymous sites. Because the synonymous sites aren't affected as much, we could say, like, let's just look at all synonymous sites in important genes. Are they mutating randomly? And then let's look at synonymous sites in less important genes. Do we have as many mutations occurring there when the genome copies itself? And the answer is, apparently, based on these data and others now, uh, yes, right? They're just as likely to have mutation in a synonymous site in an important gene versus a non-important gene. And it's very likely that the base rate next to it that's really important also has just as much of a chance to mutate as the synonymous site next to it. Again, we just don't see that mutation necessarily pass to us where we can visualize it because the organism is dead by the time we try to sequence it. Um, now, you can, do, you can do this in bacteria and other organisms where you can look at one cell and then the very next cell that has divided from it, and you can see extreme lethal mutations before they actually kill the organism. And so we know lethal mutations happen, right? That's we, we actually know uh, that they occur. But uh, again, the super fundamental question here is, are they completely random? Uh, and to the best of our ability to see what this particular paper is making an argument is that no, it, 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 they're, I'm sorry, yes, it is random. You know, we can't see anything that suggests that uh, there is non-randomness in the original mutations. And the differences we do see between the number of mutations that survive in important genes versus unimportant genes is the result of natural selection. And that's a process we already understood, right? We already acknowledge that natural selection will eventually filter out and remove certain mutations, whereas in other portions of the genome, they don't get removed. And so we do see over time a difference in the what's called the uh, substitution rate. Not the mutation rate, the original mutations, but the substitution rate is those bases that get substituted and survive and get passed from generation to another and get fixed in populations eventually. All right, so I don't, I don't think I actually need to do these next couple slides because I've already talked about this when I did the abstract. Um, the problem with uh, you know the original Arabidopsis studies found too many mutations, and most of those mutations are probably bogus. They spend a lot of time talking about that and give examples uh, of that, and uh, and that includes potential sequencing areas at polynucleotide tracts. That's one of their bigger problems, and then we get to the conclusion. All right, 
In summary, we showed that the trend of lower mutation rates in selectively more constrained genes, or more important genes, that was recently reported in Arabidopsis is present in neither yeast nor humans. Additionally, no mutation rate differences were found. Uh, no mutation rate difference was found between genetic and intergenetic regions. All right, so genetic regions would be the coding regions that actually turn into code that or is the code that is read into proteins versus intergenic regions, which be the sections of genome between genes, um, which generally are considered to have less selectional constraint upon them. Uh, in prior yeast and fruit fly studies, we discovered that Monroe identified orders of magnitude more mutations than reported previously from the same data, data set and expected from Arabidopsis known mutation rate. So uh, that, I, that seems like a fundamental error on that previous uh, papers. Right? See, what they're saying is there's been lots of studies of what the fundamental in, in mutation rate was the original mutation. How many, and what, what we're saying there is, Per every million base pairs, how many mutations are made by the mechanism that copies DNA, right? You, you have DNA polymerase, and you have a variety of different error-correcting mechanisms. They're all working away, and uh, they create what's called the basic mutation rate. And so, as I said before, like human beings have a pretty low mutation rate overall. It's like one in every 100 million base pairs uh, when, you're, when you copy your DNA. And so the if efficacy, all right, the efficiency of our replication process is very, very good, and we don't make many errors. That one out of every million occurs in some random position. That's kind of what we're talking about here is where do the mutations occur? Not necessarily how many. In other organisms, they're not as efficient at copying their DNA, and so they make more errors. And so maybe per a million base pairs, they're going to make 10 errors or 20 errors or 100 errors, right? Where are those errors going to occur? They're occurring at random positions, but nonetheless, they're occurring at a higher rate. Um, and that's been studied before. And so what they're saying here is that Arabidopsis has been studied a lot, right? And so we have a pretty good idea what the overall error rate is. Right, the basic Arabidopsis error rate is one mutation every, I'm just gonna say every 50 million base pairs or 10 million base pairs. Um, and they know that they can control that in some sense because if you radioact if you bombard uh, Arabidopsis with uh, radiation, you'll get a higher error rate and then you can measure that error rate. But they're saying their basic error rate. And what this study was reporting is um, error rates that are orders of magnitude higher. And so I'm saying that that can't be right, right? There's too much data that suggests that here's what the error rate is. It should have only seen this many new de novo mutations, and they saw way too many de novo mutations. So either they had some bizarre plants um, that had an, a mutation in their error correcting mechanism. So in other words, they had a, a mutant plant that is making too many mistakes. They have a less efficient DNA polymerase that isn't copying right. Or the way they got their data is they're not pulling out the erroneous mutations that aren't really mutations. They're just a product of how we how we sequence. They're, they're our own, we added those mutations in our own process of, of sequencing. All right, so that's a that's a really huge problem with that uh, paper from, from earlier this year. I, I have to admit, I was really fascinated by the paper. I saw that paper when it came out. I thought it was really interesting. And I thought this is really, really cool. I mean, what if this is really true? It means that organisms can actually play around with sort of, um, you know, guiding mutations, uh, mutation rates in particular regions of their genome uh, and kind of like know where the important stuff is versus where lesser important material is and therefore kind of like take care of the most important regions of their DNA at their at the base level. Um, and so I... I, I was kind of actually intrigued by that and hoped that it might actually be true because it might lead to some new fundamental sort of mechanisms that we didn't understand before, didn't know about before that are, that are um, helping to maintain the integrity of genomes. But this paper suggests, no, we've probably been right all along that there is a basic mutation rate. You can change the mutation rate for the whole organism, 
but you can't really guide where those mutations are going to occur in terms of regions uh, of the genome. Uh, many of the extra mutation, uh, extra mutation reported by Monroe appear to be sequencing errors associated with polynucleotides. Those errors have the potential to create reported unusual mutation trend. In other words, the errors that they found are the types of errors we'd predict you would interpret as being non-random mutations. But in fact, they weren't originally mutations, so you misinterpreted. Together, our findings suggest that mutation rate is not lower in evolutionary more constrained genomic regions of any of the plant, fungal, or animal models examined so far. All right, so what they're saying is, nope, sorry. If you got excited about that previous paper, it doesn't appear that they have shown any fundamental difference in or changed our understanding of the nature of mutations. They appear to be random with respect to where they're popping up as organisms copy their DNA. Um, and I just want to remind you, just because mutations are random doesn't mean that what happens to mutations after they occur is random. That's a not necessarily a random process. Um, but the original mutations that occur from our perspective are uh, to our best ability, appear to be random, at least to this point. Um, now, maybe maybe the other authors will come back with uh, additional evidence. Um, maybe there's still something missing. Maybe I always hold that out, that there might be some deeper pattern that we're, we're missing in these studies. But um, it's it's looking like it's going to be, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly well convinced by the data they present in this particular paper that um, that there aren't any, let's put it this way, there aren't any obvious differences between mutation rates in um, uh, evolutionary constrained genes versus genes that aren't constrained by evolution. And if there were, I think that pattern would have been, uh, it, honestly, that pattern should have been noticed years ago because there's so much data out there, it should have just become obvious to some people. And so maybe that was part of the surprise of this 2022 paper. It's kind of like, how did anyone not notice this already? You know, when everybody's looked at this kind of stuff and has this data available, maybe everyone just missed it, or maybe we just had, maybe we were just predisposed to just believe this assumption that mutations happen randomly and nobody really tested it. They tested it and they found out, well, we were all wrong. Um, no, I mean, the way science works is people are like, wow, that's a really interesting result. But we need to we need to look delve into this a little farther. We, we're not simply going to throw all of our preconceived notions, our notions from before, out. Let's test that data. And upon testing and looking at it a little closer, uh, it's found that now there's there's some pretty obvious explanations for why they saw the pattern that they did. And when we look, we don't see that same pattern anywhere else. And so probably mm, this idea that mutations don't occur randomly with respect to fitness is uh, probably not true. Well, thanks for hanging out with me as we talked about this recent paper on mutation rates. Mutation rates are a really tricky subject to talk about. And so I'm, I, you know, I, I don't want to gloss over anything. And yet at the same time, I'm afraid to like get into too many details. So I hope that wasn't too confusing about original mutation rate, um, how mutation rates can differ between organisms, and yet the randomness of where mutations occur uh, is still a constant phenomena among all different organisms. Uh, and then there's this thing called substitution rate, and this is where many, many people get confused in terms of the difference between substitution rate and uh, mutation rate. Uh, and substitution rate is what we're usually observing. It's like when you, when you if you were to sequence uh, a population of organisms in one generation, previous generations and so forth, and look at what happens over time, you're looking at what mutations survive to future generations. In other words, what mutations are substitutions, changes in the population uh, over time. And that's gonna be a different rate than the raw mutation rate, the original mutations that occur because natural selection is, is playing a uh, part of the process because natural selection is getting rid of some mutations and that's not a random process. And so messes up your original view of where the original mutations occurred. 
Um, so this idea of getting down to the original actual mutation rates, like how fast do mutations occur, how often do they occur, and then where do those mutations occur? That's the thing we're focused on here. The mutations appear to focus, the, the mutations appear to occur completely at random with respect to anything about what the organism might know about what it needs to keep and not keep. And it's sort of up to natural selection. And the other process, the other evolutionary processes, um, or maybe I shouldn't even use the word evolutionary processes, right? Genetic processes, right? Biological processes. There are other biological processes which have the responsibility to take the mutations it's been given and say, okay, here's how we can continue to survive as an organism, right? We're going to, you know, ignore these mutations. These mutations aren't important. These other ones that are really important, they're going to affect that particular organism, but that organism is an individual in a population that individual may not survive, but the population will survive because other individuals don't have that particular mutation. Um, and so that's the weeding out process uh, for uh, the landscape of mutations that are occurring constantly between organisms. So Mike, to go back, I'm gonna, I'm rambling now, but there's just a couple of things that I, that I talk about, say, with my class sometimes. As I, because this, like I said, this is a really hard topic and my students have a lot of trouble with it, maybe because it's because of my bad communication, but I happen to know this is, this is always a difficult topic for like everybody. But if I go back to my, my fingers, right? And I say like, there's a lot of mutations in that. In one cell in this finger, if I pull it out, there's hundreds of thousands of differences between that cell and this finger versus the cell in this finger over here. Right. And in a sense, my body's already done natural selection, right? Because I'm sure that along the way of making cells to get to the point where it makes my finger, a few divisions made a mutation that made a lethal mistake. Right. But those the products of that lethal mistake aren't with me anymore because that cell died. Right. It's no longer present. It's not in my fingers. And other cells that didn't have that particular mutation, but had another different mutation because it's random, right? You had, you had, you made uh, 10,000 cells as you're starting to make your finger and the original 10,000 cells, you know, a couple of them never made it because they had, because they made mutations in the wrong spots. But the other ones have mutations in locations randomly that are like, eh, this doesn't really affect you. Like, it's not going to change the fact you can make a finger and you can do stuff with it, right? And so those mutations survive. So that's natural selection happening within your cells in your body uh, to get you to the end result, which is an, a, you know, a living thing that's functionally able to survive. And then... And then the, the crazy thing, of course, is that, yes, I might have made a lot of mutations and there's a lot of mutations between my two fingers, um, but it kind of doesn't matter what mutations happen there as long as they work, as long as whatever the final version works and does what I need it to work. So I'm a functional organism and have fitness. I've got a bunch of kids. Um, I didn't give any of these mutations to my kids. All right. Because they all occurred outside of the line of cells that are dividing to form my somatic cells, which are the cells of my body versus my germline cells, um, sperm. And those are more highly protected. And the mutation rate. All right. In germline cells is lower. All right. Uh, because we spend more time and more effort, more energy protecting the code. Uh, for our germline cells. And as a result, uh, I'm only passing on a few mutations, right? It's still not perfect. No organism, you know, can obtain perfection in terms of like never making a mistake as it copies its cells uh, over time. But in your germline cells, you're not going to undergo as many cell reproduction times because you're very early, early on in embryonic development, you're going to set those cells aside. Uh, so it's not like you make a whole organism and it's like, okay, now I'm going to make the sex cells out of that because then they'll have gone through hundreds of thousands of cell divisions. And so there's greater chances of errors accumulating substitution rate in that case. Um, so you, you make fewer mistakes uh, overall. Now, when I say make fewer mistakes, I don't mean that I make fewer mistakes in some unimportant regions and I make none in the important spots in my sperm. Now, I made fewer mistakes. They're still randomly distributed. At least it still looks like that's the case. They're still randomly distributed in the genome. And then those will get passed to my kids. 
not the mutations that happen in my fingers, which is why our bodies don't care as much about like the mutation rates in our hands. All right, you can have a higher mutation rate there in those cells. And they probably do because they're exposed to the sun and other, other environmental influences that actually increase mutation rates. Once again, though, where do the mutations happen in my fingers? They happen in random spots in the genome. They happen randomly with respect to how important that particular location is. Um, and just to be super repetitive, they happen randomly, but if one cell is dividing in my skin and it makes a, 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 a mutation in an important gene for survival of that cell, that particular cell dies. And so it simply doesn't continue with me, right? I only keep the cells that can survive. Uh, and so that weeds out the really bad mutations very, very quickly. That's super strong selection uh, that's occurring in those particular locations. All right, so I, I fully expect, you know, so the thing about papers like this one earlier this year, it's like it's important that, um, that these really fundamental ideas about mutations um, be examined, right? And I think it was really important that, that uh, their observation, right? They're not faking that data. This is, this is what they saw. They thought it was really interesting and potentially an important pattern that needed to be investigated further, right? They're saying, look, there's this weird pattern that suggests that maybe mutations aren't random with respect to like how important that particular location is. And that would be really important to know because if that's true, uh, it means organisms have more control over where they allow mutations to happen than we think. So I understand why that's in nature and I understand they had a big data set and this appeared on the surface to be, you know, a pretty solid, you know, a pretty solid piece of evidence that we might need to question this idea of the randomness, the raw randomness of mutations in genomes. Um, but that's that's the nature of how science works, you know. So that gets put out, it gets discussed, and people are like, "Hey, I can find ways of testing that, right? If we did this, we do this. We look at these different organisms, and I look at these other patterns, and then people start looking more closely at that original data, and they start saying to themselves." you know what, even your original data might have had bias in it that you were unaware of, right? Maybe you got so excited by your result, we're humans, right? Scientists are humans, and as much as we like to think that we're like, we like question ourselves all the time about every little piece of data, okay, well, how else could I explain this? This is what you should be doing. It's like, well, how else could I explain this, this, this result that seems to go against what most people think is happening? Oh, well, maybe something about my data is actually influencing my, my original data set. I needed to check my original data a little more closely to see if there isn't it's some implicit biases there. And a lot of times you're so close to it, you don't maybe don't see those things. And you're excited about getting this thing published and you're kind of convinced yourself. Right. But that's that's sort of now how science works. You, you, you publish that and then other people don't have that bias. Right. You know, they're like. Eh, I don't know about that. Is that really true? And if if it's really true, that's really exciting. So I'll do further research. And if I can if I can support your data, great. I will also be able to say I added to this new piece this new building data set that suggests that we need to rethink the nature of mutations, of basal mutation rates and 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 locations. Um but maybe when I do that, I also find out I could find out that maybe it's not really true in which case that other paper needs to be debunked, right? We need, we need to show that it's not accurate. And that's what this paper does. Um, they might have come into the, their, they may have come into the process thinking to themselves, I'm really skeptical. I just don't believe this data set. Uh, and maybe they saw some things in the original paper that the original uh, reviewers didn't see uh, as potential problems. And so they went to test those potential problems. And sure enough, they found out there were problems. Um, and like I said, I, I find that their evidence is pretty compelling, all right? They made me, they have made, they have succeeded in making me very skeptical about the Arabidopsis uh, data. Um, does that mean that's the end of the story? Nope, not necessarily. I'm sure that there's others that are doing these types of analyses and these particular authors might have missed something too. Maybe there is a hidden pattern in there somewhere that is yet to be revealed. Uh, and that's what's exciting about science. That's what I enjoy uh, about this process. So this is an important question. 
And it is important that people really do fine scale detail analysis and that they're skeptical and they continue to test these ideas. And I think that's what we're seeing in the literature right now is testing these ideas. And where we stand right now is it still looks like mutations are happening randomly with respect to the consequences of those particular mutations. All right, that's it for me today. Um, I've got some other recent papers that have just come out that I also want to talk about, and I'm, I'm probably going to try to do a little bit more of that. I'm teaching genetics right now, and in that class, I am uh, I'm devoting a day out of the week to just like talking about hot topics or something that's new in the literature, uh, and then relating it to something that we've been discussing in class. And so some of those topics, you know, if they lend themselves to me making a video for, I'll try to double dip on what I'm learning and uh, make a video at the same time uh, talking about something that's new in the world of genetics and molecular biology. All right, with that, uh, again, my name is Joel Duff. Uh, hey, subscribe if you want more of this kind of content or the other really eclectic content on my channel. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.